Stove Leg Media, igniting conversation. On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old nursing student Maura Murray stunned everyone in her life when she abruptly packed up her dorm room, drained her bank accounts, and told her professor she would be gone for a week. That evening, police 150 miles away responded to a crashed vehicle. Murray Saturn was at the scene, but Murray herself was not present. In fact, she's never been seen again. What happened to Maura Murray? Will her family ever know the truth behind her disappearance? This is True Crime Cast. This is True Crime Cast. Jamie and John here with a really big case. This one is crazy. I say that every week. I feel like I need to get a new line, but all the cases we do are crazy. This one is just mysterious. I'll say that. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to cover a case that's super boring. This one's hopefully. super f- No, I'm not <laughs> ever going to say this is super fun, but this is a very interesting case. It's mysterious, and uh, I think it's going to be a good one. A lot of conversation we can have in this one. Yeah, certainly a big topic in the true crime world for a few years now, and we're excited to give any new information that's out and share our takes on that. But before we do, John, do we have anybody to thank? I do. I have Amy that I would like to thank for coming in on a $3 level over on Patreon.com. Thank you so much, Amy. And if you haven't already checked out our Patreon page, We have a ton of exclusive content only available to Patreon members. So go over there, check it out, www.patreon.com. When you're there, search for True Crimecast. Awesome. Uh, As you got from the opening, we're going to be talking about the disappearance of Maura Murray, which happened in 2004. And we're going to break down the details of that. There have been some relatively new developments in not necessarily finding Maura, but some more... Uh, updates about people are on the peripheral of the case. So I guess let's start off with the basics, John. Why don't you get us rolling? Yeah, we're going to go back to February 9th, 2004. That's when 21-year-old Maura Murray was having a pretty busy day. So let's talk about what was going on. Maura was normally a happy-go-lucky person. She was a nursing student, and she really stunned all those people in her life when she abruptly packed up her dorm room drained her bank accounts, which consisted of like not thousands of dollars, but like a few hundred or so dollars and told her professors that she was going to be gone for a week. Afterwards, she packed up her Saturn and left her college town of Amherst, Massachusetts and telling those in her life that she was going home after a sudden death in her family. However, that evening, about 150 miles north of Amherst in the town of Haverville, New Hampshire, police responded after a tip that Murray's black Saturn had slammed into a tree. So when police got to the scene, the vehicle was heavily damaged. It had left the road. It had smashed into some trees and spun around so that it was facing oncoming traffic. It appeared to be kind of a typical accident until police realized two key facts. One, there was nobody in the vehicle, and all the doors were locked, and a rag was stuffed in the exhaust pipe of the vehicle. So, I mean, so to kind of sum up the scene here, they get here, the car's facing the wrong way, nobody that belongs to the car is there, and oddly, there's a a rag stuffed in the tailpipe. So, I don't know. Yeah, it certainly (laughs) has to take them aback a little bit they're expecting we're going to come up on this scene there's going to be somebody there we'll get a tow truck we'll talk them through reporting and then we'll be done with it but it was really the start of something much much bigger and mora didn't call the police to report this this was actually reported by another man and so when police arrived at the scene they were able to interview the man who phoned in the accident he told them that a young woman had been driving that he saw her slam into the trees and that she wasn't seriously injured. She begged him not to report the accident, and when police arrived, they found a box of wine in the passenger seat and other evidence that perhaps the driver, presumably Mora, had been driving under the influence. Now, she was, again, nowhere to be found. The whole episode, driving while intoxicated, abandoning her responsibilities, and taking off on a whim, were entirely out of character for her. She's normally a very responsible person, but she had a trouble 
or a bit of trouble in her past, but nothing amounting to running away from her life. So this is just really uncharacteristic of her. Friends and professors thought very little of it at the time. However, she claimed that there was a death in the family, which seemed reasonable until the investigation surrounding her bizarre disappearance revealed a shocking fact. There was no death in her family, and the motivation behind her fleeing her life responsibilities remains a mystery. Yeah, John, there's just so much to look at here, and you gave kind of a synopsis, but you can dig back into this, and new information kind of pops up every time you revisit, I guess, the scene, right? So Butch Atwood was the guy that called 911. She asked him not to and said she'd call AAA. Then we find out she couldn't have called AAA because... There was no cell service there. You mentioned she had uh, run into trees, which is what was reported. There are others say that she actually hit a snowbank and her car was able to drive. So just so many mixed reports and details coming out of all this. And this was in uh, kind of rural area, but it wasn't like in the sticks where we're from, right? It was there were there were a lot of houses. There were people around. Yeah, people there, would have seen this or at least been around the scene. And I guess, let me pause you right there for a second. What's interesting is I've heard a lot of things about this case. I've read a lot. They say it was a minor wreck, but her airbags did deploy. So she hit something hard enough for her airbags to come out. I've hit some things in my car pretty hard and my airbags never came out. So uh, it, it was, I'm not going to say she was like critically injured, but it was, it was a pretty good hit that she put into something. Yeah, it was not, uh, some people have called it a fender bender. I don't know that airbags typically deploy in those situations they can and maybe it was a situation like that it was an older car but let's go back and talk a little bit about Maura's childhood it was pretty uneventful she was born may 4th of 1982 in hanson massachusetts she was part of a large catholic family and was one of five kids as a young child her parents got divorced and she mostly lived with her mother she was a star on her high school track and field team, and she applied to and was enrolled at the prestigious West Point Military Academy. And she ultimately ended up at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, where she was studying nursing. She ended up completing three years of nursing classes before she disappeared. A few months prior to her disappearance in November of 2003, Mora had a run-in with local police and campus officials in Amherst. She was caught using a stolen credit card where she had racked up a small amount of charges at local restaurants and uh, had built up some debt on this card, obviously, that didn't belong to her. She would admit to copying the credit card number off a receipt that she found and started impersonating the owner to use the card. However, due to the small amount taken here, it was less than $250. Uh, her willingness to admit that she had done wrong, she seemed really remorseful for this act. She didn't have a prior criminal record. The case was dismissed in December of 2003. Again, that's about three months before she disappeared. However, John, this wasn't the first time that she had had an issue with theft. It's been rumored, and, and some would say it's been confirmed, that she was kicked out of West Point for stealing makeup from a commissary. So she kind of has a pattern of, I don't know, what do you say, petty theft there, but it doesn't amount to her being a troubled person or uh, having a big criminal record, as I said a few minutes ago. It's really kind of small stains on an otherwise solid academic, athletic, and personal record. But her run-in came just four months before her disappearance. And that leaves some to wonder if it was kind of a cry for help, if she was looking to solve something, to find a missing part of her life and acting out to get attention to help her find that, or if it's just another piece of this huge puzzle behind her disappearance. So let's kind of back up and go through the, the few days before her disappearance. Hopefully that can give us some perhaps clues or kind of give us an indication of what was going on with her in her life at the time. So just a few days before she fled town, she apparently had a strange breakdown. On February 5th, 2004, Murray was working her night shift as a security guard. She was talking on the phone with her sister, Kathleen. Now, Kathleen would re reveal later that in that conversation, it really centered around issues that Kathleen was having with her fiance. Later that night, Murray's manager came to check on her to see how she was doing only to find her in tears at the security desk. 
The supervisor would later describe her as completely zoned out. There was no reaction at all. She was kind of just in a state of being unresponsive. She was just emotionally checked out of the world. So the supervisor was concerned about Mora and actually was just willing to walk her back to her dorm and and say, let's call it a night. So she was dropped off shortly after 1 a.m. that night after she had kind of checked out of her job because of this conversation with Kathleen. So it was later revealed that Kathleen was a recovering alcoholic. But in, during that phone call, we learned, or Mora learned, that she had been driven to the liquor store by her fiancé and was encouraged to resume drinking. So basically, she learned that her sister, who was otherwise on the straight and narrow, had been encouraged by her fiancé to resume drinking. And that kind of broke her heart, I guess. I mean, is that kind of how you interpret her response to that news? Yeah, absolutely. I think any time that a, a family member or a loved one, you feel like they're in trouble and they're going down a path that you know is awful for them and you can't do anything about it, that's something that certainly puts a big weight on you. And especially at this time of her life, she's in college and just a lot going on. Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, I should never assume how someone should feel at that. You can, uh, you can presume that she felt sad. She maybe felt anger at her sister and maybe her fiance for encouraging this behavior after somebody was in a state of recovery. So probably safe to say lots of emotions going on there at this news of a loved one, especially your sister. This call remained unknown for over a decade after Murray's disappearance when Kathleen finally made it known in 2017. All right, so two days after that, February 7th, Mora's father arrived on her college campus to help her buy a car. In the early morning hours of February 8th, Murray dropped her father off at his hotel and used his car to drive to a party. At around 3.30 a.m., she wrecked his vehicle and almost totaled it. Now, at the scene of this accident... There was no field sobriety test given at the scene, but there is some evidence to suggest that she was perhaps driving drunk. So she's just received the news about her sister and her drinking, and so it's possible, I don't know what you think, Jamie, but it's possible that she was driving drunk herself and then ended up having this particular wreck. Very interesting chain of events there. Right, it yeah, it's this getting behind the psychology of this, especially when a loved one's involved, just almost impossible. So the next day, her father was able to rent a rental car and drive himself back home. Now, Murray sent the email to her professors and supervisors on this at this time, claiming that there had been a death in the family, that she was going to have to leave for a while. And it's after this that she withdrew about three hundred dollars and spent 40 of it on alcohol. She left, and while she was on her way out, she picked up the police report from the previous night's accident. And I'm going to stop right there. I mean, doesn't that tell you that she's, at least her intentions are, to pick up this paperwork and give it to her father? I mean, like, if you're planning on disappearing, if you're planning on never seeing your family again, why pick this up? It seems like she's planning to act responsibly. She's going to use the report, give it to her dad any insurance purposes that she needs it for. Yeah, it seems like she's definitely got plans to uh, handle the situation and see it through to completion. Yep. So that's the day of her disappearance. At about 5 p.m. on the day that she disappeared, she placed a bizarre call to her own phone, and we can assume that this was dialing her voicemail. Three hours later, she wrecked her car, and we've never seen her again. After the break, we'll dig into the investigation and talk about how authorities looked for answers in the disappearance of Maura Murray. Hey guys, Jamie and John here, and we want to tell you how excited we are to be able to offer new merchandise for our podcasts. Yeah, we have partnered with a company called Tee Public. We have listed the links to our store below in our show notes. We've also put those on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But Jamie, there's a ton of stuff you can find over there. T-shirts, phone cases, mugs, travel mugs, hoodies, and even masks, John. There is a ton of new products over there. It's way better than the store we used to have. You can customize your order. Like if you want a shirt that's yellow or green or blue, whatever, you can make that happen. So go over there and check that out today, and you will not be disappointed. 
Initially, John, police regarded this scene as a young woman disappearing on purpose. We hear that a lot, right? Anytime we talk about a missing person or somebody disappearing, the police seem very quick to say, well, this person just didn't want to be found. It wasn't until 24 hours after this car accident that she was actually reported as a missing person. Now, there are a few clues as to her whereabouts, or at least her intentions for where she was going that night, that we find inside her vehicle. Uh, There were printed directions to a condo in Burlington, Vermont. Now, her cell phone records would indicate that she had called the landlord for those condos in question, and police believe that she had intended to move in. Now, John, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, but author James Renner had written a book about this case, True Crime Addict, and, and, and we'll talk more about his book and his work a little later. But he, he consults with us from time to time on, on episodes, and, and he wanted to make sure to note here that information has come out to show that Mora was actually inquiring about two-bedroom condos when she was calling this number, which leads you to believe that maybe she wasn't traveling alone or she was planning on meeting somebody there, but it could have meant that she wasn't traveling alone, which could be a big piece of this puzzle. Most of her possessions were loaded in her car, but her wallet, credit cards, and cell phone weren't there when police arrived on the scene. And 16 years later, none of those things have been located. The cell phone hasn't been used since that night. Her wallet hasn't been found, and those credit cards haven't been used or found either. Some of the alcohol that she had bought earlier in the evening, you mentioned there was a box of wine in the seat. On the receipt from the liquor store, there were some other things that she had purchased that were no longer there when police arrived. Desperate for leads, police tracked down everything that had happened back in Amherst, where they discovered her dorm room had been completely packed up. Sitting on top of one of the boxes was a typed letter to her boyfriend, who we're going to talk more about later, which listed a host of issues in their relationship. As days went by without any leads as to where Mora was, Police increasingly became concerned for her well-being and ramped up their efforts to locate her. They did a search all around the area where her accident had happened. They had helicopters that scanned an area of 20 square miles looking for any sign of an individual that had been seen there. They brought dogs who lost her scent about 100 feet from the vehicle. Police also looked at 911 logs from witnesses to the crash. Like we said, this was in a neighborhood inexplicably one of the calls reported that there was a man with Maura Murray in the vehicle and another witness said that they saw while she was standing outside of the vehicle what looked to be a cigarette lighting up as it was inhaled the witness who said she saw a man later retracted that statement saying she was mistaken why she reported an initially remains to be a mystery. We don't know why she would just make that up. Although she did say, like I said, she saw that red light in the vehicle and assumed that the man had a cigarette. I mean, let's just assume that she saw the crash, right? So if you saw the crash and the airbags deployed, there could be some, the powdery residue stuff that would probably look like some smoke. So maybe she just quickly saw that and assumed there was somebody in there. She said she saw a red light. I mean, I I don't know what that could necessarily be. I mean, she stuck to that part of the story, and that could have been anything from just a dashboard light to a car charger. Or the overhead light in the smoke. I mean, who knows? Who knows? Between 15 and 45 minutes after police were notified of the accident, somewhere around 8 to 8.30 p.m., there was a motorist passing by that claimed that he saw a young person. He couldn't identify whether it was a male or female, but he said he saw them east of the accident scene along that same highway. His description matches at least the size of Maura Murray, but he didn't report this until months later. And when he realized that he had saw an individual that same night uh, that a person had vanished on that highway, he panicked and then called in. But again, it's months later and you can't track, or it's very, very difficult to track somebody in that scenario. So you had said that the dogs that were brought in had kind of dropped her scent about 100 yards away from the car. Why would they do that, John? Why would the scent just go go away? Well, I guess police assumed that it was because she had left in another vehicle. So her, like I said, her scent was gone. So, I mean, if she had wandered into the woods or just kept on walking and walking and walking, the dogs would have continued to smell that. But there was no scent anymore. So I think it's safe to assume she got in another car, whether that was on her own 
like she wanted to do that or she was forced into another vehicle. We don't know, but I think that is a safe assumption. About 24 hours after her disappearance, police interview her boyfriend, but they really didn't get anything from that interview. However, he did reveal that on his way to New Hampshire to talk with police, he received a voicemail that he believed was from Mora, and in it, he heard a woman sobbing. And the police were able to trace that call to a Red Cross office. Why? (laughs) Yeah, and why couldn't they get any records from that Red Cross office to show who had been there, who had used the phone, and how they helped that person? Did This This is weird. This is a weird thing to have said, and I was wondering if you had any more insight. Yeah, this seems like a really odd place to... To just kind of stop. You would think they had to look into this further and hit a dead end or else that would still be something that they were chasing down. Right? And maybe this is one of those things that we're never going to know the full story until we know the full story. Maybe this is something they're keeping close to their chest. I just think it's a really weird thing to say and to have no more information on it. Yep. Agree. So given her erratic behavior in the months leading up to her disappearance, which, you know, we've talked about her crash in her father's car, the increased drinking, the run-ins with the police, law enforcement began to theorize that her disappearance may have been an elaborate plan to commit suicide. Now, her family has always adamantly denied this possibility. They pointed in part to her apparent destination, which was Vermont to rent a condo. Why would you go through the hoops of trying to rent a condo if you're going to commit suicide? Right. So her family has denied all of this, and and it doesn't make sense to me either. I mean, I don't know what you think there, but... Yeah, I mean, it's hard to put together. Let's say that she had this erratic behavior, and then, I don't know, most of the time people just kind of get help or they... Uh, go down kind of a path of self-destruction. The the disappearance makes all of it impossible to separate it, but it could be just completely unrelated to anything in her life leading up to it. So it's hard to say that, yes, this was part of the plan all along, but you also can't disprove something that didn't happen. Right. She was definitely going through some stuff, but, but I don't know that that necessarily means that all this is connected, like you just said. One week after she disappeared, police were still having difficulty finding any viable leads as to why she disappeared. They repeated in media interviews that she may be suicidal, raising the stakes for hopefully people trying to help out and find her more quickly. Her father and boyfriend appeared on national television to solicit tips and information and even raise money to help expand the search into nearby Vermont, which may have been her intended destination. The FBI were able to join the case after about a week of failed attempts to find her. The FBI contended that there was no evidence that Mora, if still alive, was in the area in which her vehicle had crashed, and they opened up the search to an investigation that included all 50 states. So at this point, everybody in America was looking for Mora Murray. The The family stayed in New Hampshire for nearly a month, And they personally searched for her. This is heartbreaking. I mean, could you imagine you're, you stay up in a place for a month so that you can go out every day and search for your, your daughter, your sister, your girlfriend, you know, whatever, however she's related to you. And they were trying to gain attention for the case the whole time though. There's no leads. There's no new evidence. And, you know, you kind of start to lose hope. So they stayed until the end of February 2004 trying to personally find her. Now, prior to leaving, local law enforcement turned over all of her possessions that were found inside the car to her family. Fred Murray continued to return to the area to search for his missing daughter every weekend, and he usually did that by himself. And that is absolutely heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. It's also puzzling to me that they turned over everything in the car. If there was foul play involved, there's very likely some evidence in there, and this seems kind of irresponsible of the police department. But I mean, maybe they maybe they only gave them stuff that was like, you know, they knew it was her stuff, so it was safe to give it away. Hopefully they combed the car very, very well. Uh I don't know. <laughs> Thanks for giving them the benefit of the doubt. I'm I trying. Will not, I'm trying. I'll not be so generous today. 
About a month after her disappearance, about 90 miles away from her crash site in Montgomery, Vermont, there was another disappearance of a 17-year-old named Brianna Maitland. She vanished after leaving her job. Her car was found the next day near an abandoned building, and she was never heard from or seen again. Despite still being listed as a missing person, Maitland's case has been connected with a serial killer and rapist who was in Vermont at the time. His name is Israel Keys. Now, two young women vanishing within the same month, within 100 miles from each other, in this remote area of New England, for some people, that's just too coincidental. So theories started to fly around that uh, a serial killer, Keys hadn't been named yet at that point or captured, the serial killer was on the loose, preying on young women. In the public's eye, Mora's disappearance was attributed to the serial killer as well, and these two were related because they had happened in the same time frame in the same area, but police were really quick to dismiss this theory that Mora's disappearance had anything to do with a serial killer. State and local officials reiterated this over and over again, saying there was no forensic relationship between these two missing person cases, and they still felt like Maura Murray may have had other things going on in her life and that more than likely they thought that she had taken her own life. Later on in 2004, just months after the accident, Fred Murray was approached by a strange man. Now, John, there are a lot of weird things surrounding this case. We haven't even circled back to the the rag and the tailpipe and some other things going on with the car. But there's a guy that approached Fred Murray with a rusty knife that had an unexplained stain on it. He claimed that that knife had belonged to his brother, who is a violent criminal living near the scene of Moore's disappearance. This guy would tell Fred Murray that his brother acted really weird in the days right after Moore Murray had disappeared. He told Fred that he believed that his brother had something to do with it and that he possibly used this knife to kill Mora. Within days, this brother that the man had referenced had his car destroyed at a local junkyard. Other relatives of the brother deny any involvement, claiming that the man who approached Fred was just trying to get his hands on some reward money. Police investigated, but nothing ever came from this tip, if you want to call it that. About a year after she vanished, there was an anonymous tip that came in that revealed... A man said he found a backpack matching Maura Murray's. Police were able to track that backpack down. It was at a rest stop about 30 miles away from the incident. Again, this is a year later. They took possession of the backpack, but we still don't know whether or not it was hers. They haven't come forward and said, yes, we found her backpack. We think something was taken from it, or we found this information on it or not. So we don't know about this backpack, but I would find it odd if there was just a backpack sitting at a rest stop a year later that somebody had just dropped off right after they tried to disappear. Yeah. I mean, that's add that to the long growing list of many weird things about this case. Right. I mean, who knows? We don't know. And it's hard to speculate on something so bizarre. So this case, you know, continued to grow cold. I can't imagine what it would feel like to be more as family, not knowing what happened to their daughter. There was widespread media attention devoted to it. And I think this is awesome. A a group of retired investigators actually took on this case pro bono just to try to help out, to try to find what happened to Mora, try to give her family some answers because they deserve that. There was little that happened in the years after that that would really lead anywhere. But there's one more interesting thing that I want to talk about. So you mentioned the 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 guy who said that his brother had been acting weird. He had his car destroyed by the junkyard days after her disappearance right yeah well they brought cadaver dogs to an abandoned house near the crash site and the dogs actually hit on a closet two years after the disappearance so that indicated that at some point there was a dead body being stored there really weird right so the house in question belonged to the brother of the person that was making the accusations yeah so Seems like we're kind of narrowing in on a suspect here, right? You would think so. It seems to, I guess, match up with the story of this man that approached Fred Murray with a bloody knife. 
But again, we see no arrest there yet. There's there's no arrest, and there's not going to be an arrest. So, <laughs> spoiler alert, it doesn't doesn't really lead anywhere. But I mean, that's a huge piece of this investigation. That's I I think that's you need to be more focused on that, and uh, that's a big deal. Cadaver dogs. We've talked about them a lot on this on this. Uh, show and i think it's really interesting that there was a dead body stored in that closet now the carpet was collected it was analyzed for dna those results are classified and have never been publicly released so that's all we have to go on right now 10 years after she vanished there were still no credible sightings of murray there was still really no answers in 2014 investigators commented they said we don't know if mora is a victim but the state is treating this as a potential homicide. It may be a missing persons case, but it is being handled as a criminal investigation. We have not had any credible sightings of Mora since she, the day that she disappeared. So that same year, Fred Murray, who for a decade had been trying to fight and keep the case at the forefront of police and public attention, it seems like he finally lost hope. Media accounts began to indicate that he believed that she had been abducted on the night of her accident and killed shortly thereafter. In 2019, he told interviewers that he believed his daughter was killed at a nearby home, the one in which the cadaver dogs had indicated the body had been hit in. Due in part to his belief, the basement of the home was excavated last year to determine if she had been buried there. She was not found, and there has been some evidence to suggest that the ground had been disturbed at the house. I, again, man, that's I think this is critical, but nothing has come from it. So you're leaning that way. You think that's certainly a viable direction for this investigation? I mean, I think it's Occam's razor, and we have the weird guy who came forward to say that his brother was kind of a criminal and had done some weird things. He the bloodstained knife, the car disappearing, it's starting to make sense. And now there's a cadaver dog who hits on that house. If it's not Mora, it's somebody, yeah. and somebody deserves to know what happened there. I mentioned earlier James Renner. He wrote uh, True Crime Addict, which is a book about his investigation into the disappearance of Mora Murray. And in the book, he really puts forth a different theory. And this theory is that she packed up her belongings in her car. She left her boyfriend a breakup letter that we talked about earlier that was in her dorm room. And that she took off to start a new life. She was going to settle in Burlington, Vermont and start over for all intents and purposes. He believed that she left the scene on foot hitchhiking to Canada. Uh, he would then say that he believed that she did not meet a violent end as many people believe he said in his book that the night of her emotional breakdown at work, she had discovered that she was pregnant and fled her life to raise a baby in privacy. He's written in his book, she ran away to survive, to protect herself and her baby. And talk about a motive to remain quiet for 11 years. Can you get anything better than protecting a kid? That's definitely one way to avoid any custody troubles. Now, he's been bashed a little bit by... Uh, some people in the media about this theory, but he's not stopped investigating. He's not pigeonholing this is what happened. He's presenting this as an option, and he is open to other options. And I directly asked him, do you believe that she's off living somewhere or due to some recent things that he's written that I'll talk about in a little while, do you think foul play is involved? And his answer was, I honestly don't know. I hope she's somewhere safe and happy. I don't know if the boyfriend had anything to do with it. And then he shared some details with me that have been placed on his blog that we'll get to in a minute. He does share in his book that he received an email from somebody who had a close personal relationship with Murray. The message claims that she wanted to escape her abusive boyfriend. And this is what was in Renner's book. He said, he then started talking to me about the missing girl who had gone to West Point and then to UMass. I hadn't heard about it at the time, and he explained to me what I now know is the Maura Murray case. He told me that it was an open secret among people who knew her personally at UMass that she had run off on her own to get away from an abusive relationship. He said that he knew people that knew her 
and that had been in on the whole thing. Another strange email that somebody sent to Renner was that the subject line was simply stop looking. It was sent from a fake email account using a name Ray Rumau, which can be rearranged to spell Maura Murray if you want to do it. And that email has some coordinates in it to a remote hiking trail. And Renner believes that if she was abducted, that that could be the coordinates to her body. Now, like I said, he continues to write about the case on his blog. Uh, if you want to go check that out, that is mysterycom And a lot of the writing does have to do with the boyfriend, John. A lot of things have come up. He suggests that the phone call that she received the night of her breakdown was actually from the boyfriend. Now, again, you mentioned that her sister confirmed what the conversation was about, but that the boyfriend called later, and that may have led to her uh, going out and getting drunk and getting in that accident. The boyfriend is currently in Washington, D.C. right now, John, being charged with stalking and sexual assault. And one of the ladies claiming that she was assaulted says that he choked her while they were having sex and called her Maura Murray while he was choking her. That's, again, so many weird things in this case, but no answers. And that's just a really weird thing. It is. And it's it's really intense. And, I mean, there are accusations that the boyfriend's gone on Reddit and created fake accounts to steer investigations away from himself. There have been a lot of lawsuits involving the boyfriend and kind of getting his name away from this. And a lot of that continues to come up. And there is another uh, piece of information that just came out last week that we'll get to in a minute. But we do want to talk about a couple other theories about what some people believe may have happened and some other creepy stuff that has happened. Yeah, one of those is a really weird thing and i keep saying that all all the time but there was a youtube account created by someone named 112 dirtbag um any any thoughts on why this name would be relevant to the case yeah it was off of highway 112 is where the accident happened and in the interview you mentioned earlier where murray's father said he felt like his daughter was taken by quote unquote some dirt bags so 112 dirt bag seems to directly reference yeah so the highway was 12 so it's like saying 112 like i'm the dirtbag basically is saying i'm the guy who's responsible so these this channel is still on youtube you can still watch these videos and it is bizarre in the videos there's a toothless man who sits alone in a dark room and laughs in a terrifying manner um i, I don't know it if we can, uh, we'll just point you there and you can watch those on your own. Yeah. We were going to drop a clip, but honestly, I'd rather not. Let's I'd, just, uh, go check that out if you are curious. Yeah. I'd rather not play the audio for a couple of reasons. One, you may not want to be involved in that. And two, if you are interested, the visual is necessary as well. Yep. It's a, uh, it's bizarre. So go check those out. The YouTuber has not been identified at this time. We don't know if this is just a guy who is sick and is, I don't know, trying would, to take credit or alluding that he's responsible and, or he may know something. I don't know, man. What do he you think? He is sick. I'll tell you that. Whether or not he had anything to do with it, I don't know. Police came out a week before this podcast is released and kind of responded to uh, an ongoing some some litigation happening there in Merrimack County Superior Court in New Hampshire about this case. There are people that are trying to get access to crime scene photos, to other information about the case, to try to get more information. And obviously, police always hold back information to help them identify the real killer in these situations. So they do have to hold some things back. But in this lawsuit... The I guess the defense at this point, who would have been the DA's office and the police, said that they worry that releasing these photographs and evidence will result in more, quote unquote, false leads and cruel hoaxes. And that may have been uh, referring to a few different things. There have been people that have tried to derail the investigation by creating fake testimony and coming forward and giving stories that try to get the police off the track of 
of actually catching the a potential killer. But there was also a scenario where the police officer that responded to the scene, John, there was a large group of people that accused him of having something to do with it. And there was a witness came forward and said that they passed by uh, a police vehicle and then later passed by the scene of Mora's accident where Mora's car was and that police vehicle was, but there were no people suggesting that the police officer had something to do with this. His name was Cecil Smith and he was harassed by people as this theory continued to gain traction and he later took his own life. Wow. And there was no evidence of wrongdoing by the police whatsoever. Wow. But in the big news out last week's press conference, they were saying, hey, let's not let these get out there. It's going to create a lot more problems with our investigation. And Detective West, who's in charge of the investigation, that this could cause problems, John, because this is a quote. It is reasonable to anticipate enforcement proceedings could be pending, which is saying we could be close to an arrest and we don't want to mess it up. Okay. Which has got to be encouraging for those that believe that there was foul play involved and that somebody is going to be brought to justice for this. So that's certainly what this testimony or this statement seems to say, but it also could just be saying... We're investigating it. Leave us alone. Yeah, I mean, I guess from from my point of view, I, I hope that that means that they are close and to turn it over at this point would just further complicate things. So I'm going to try to give them the benefit of the doubt and, and just hope that hopefully soon we can update you on what's happened to Mora and that her family will finally have the peace of knowing that she's, that what happened to her and where she's at and that she can... Uh, they can just kind of rest easier knowing that. You know, John, in my research, there's just one thing that I've kept going back to. And before we get into any kind of our theories or what we think may happen, the rag in the tailpipe. Yeah, what's up with that? So there was a rag in a tail in the tailpipe, which why would somebody do that? You think of a rag like a big, like a, a rag that a mechanic works on to wipe the grease off, like... Why, what would that do to a vehicle to stop up the exhaust with a rag? My first thought, well, I mean, mechanically, there's no reason why it should be there. Um, my first thought was that, was she sitting somewhere with the rag in her tailpipe, hoping that the fumes would come through the car and, and that would be her form of suicide? Yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly one of the options. I think at some point I read a report that her dad had told her that was a way to just slow down the smoke coming out of the exhaust or to slow down the noise coming out of the exhaust. But the only intention I believe you could have with that is to make the car stall out. Like it's going to, if everything gets backed up, then if it's not able to get rid of those gases, then the engine could stall out and cause it. So if somebody wanted her to break down, that may be something they did. If you believe the foul play angle, I think that's an option for why somebody would do that. I, I think that's definitely possible. Um, I don't know if it would make a car actually break down or not, or just throw out some warning lights and tell you that you got a problem. I don't know. It's it's definitely possible. And that's just one of the many weird things like we've talked about from the cell phone calls and uh, before she left and then her saying she called AAA when that was impossible. The 911 call that Butch Atwood made first went to the wrong county and he had to be redirected to the proper local authorities. So I, there are just so many weird things that happened at the scene that happened before then that have happened since I listened way back before we started a podcast. I listened to a big chunk of the missing Moore Murray podcast, which is hundreds of episodes just about this case. And in part of their investigation, they went to some cities to, to ask some tough questions and they were more or less threatened the guys who were on that podcast as part of their investigation of leave this alone and stay away. So I feel like there's something bigger going on here. I personally don't buy the idea that she disappeared on purpose. Yeah. And I'm with you there on that one. I don't think that this girl just vanished and it was her, her idea and, and something that she wanted to do to get away from whatever problems she was facing. I think she was going home to be with her family. She had intentions of giving that police report to her dad and along the way, something tragic happened, is what I think. 
Um, you mentioned Butch. I mean, heck, there's some weird things in his past too. I don't know if we did we get into those. We we haven't yet, but yeah. I he, mean, he, he was, was a truck driver at the time, or a bus driver at the time a, that happened. He was a bus driver. He was married, um, but he was a hoarder. Yeah, and there was a, some people throwing some shade of doubt on him that maybe he was more involved than just a innocent bystander who called nine one one. I mean, presumably she would have been there with him as the call was being made, and then she just vanished. So. He was Did the last he, person that we know that his, saw her alive. His story was that she he made this call, he turned around, and she was gone. I'm yeah. a little weary about that. Like, if you turned around and she was running away, you probably should see her running. If she, I mean, did she get in a car with somebody that she did? I mean, it just doesn't. The story doesn't make sense. There were at least two other neighbors that said that they saw the accident, and now this was at night. They weren't out playing in their yard or sitting on their porch, but. They heard a crash and went and looked, and another house had called 911 in addition to Butch. And so we're led to believe that everyone looked away at the same time long enough for her to disappear. Yeah, man. This is a weird one. I I pray that one day soon and very soon we can find out what happened to Maura Murray. Until then, all we have are just lots of questions. Yeah, and we kind of usually debate in these cases, do we think this one will be solved? And Unfortunately, we I usually feel like the answer is no. I think it's a yes in this one. I think we've got leads with the the basement that was excavated. We've got potential issues with the boyfriend. We've got a lot of information and a lot of investigating left to do to find some answers. So I think we may get there. And we have a police statement that kind of alludes to the fact that coming soon, we may know more. So I'm hopeful that that day comes quicker than, than not. And hopefully... When that day does, we will get justice, which obviously has not happened to this point. If those updates do come, we will absolutely share them with you every month on our Patreon episodes. We give updates on previous episodes as well as some exclusive content. So as John said before the episode, that's a great place to get more True Crime Cast if uh, this is something you enjoy. If you haven't already, please leave us a rating and a review. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so that you're notified anytime we release a new episode. Guys, we appreciate you all, and we appreciate you coming along on this case. It's an interesting one, and I hope there's updates soon. But until next crime, this has been True Crimecast. You've listened to True Crimecast, distributed by Stoveleg Media. Check out Stoveleg.com to find out more about your hosts and to find other podcasts to listen to. Stoveleg Media. Igniting Conversation.